So we've spent some time looking at the conduction system. We've looked at the process in which the air gets to the alveolar sacs. We've also looked at the composition of the alveolar sacs themselves and what they actually do, which is to say they facilitate that movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of the blood respectively. Now what I wanna do is zoom out. I wanna zoom out even further to look at how it is that we actually breathe. There are two main parameters that are being altered and changing constantly as we breathe. And these are volume, so the volume of our lungs, and that pressure that is being generated by changing that volume. So how is it that we are able to predict what is going to happen here? We rely upon Boyle's law. And what Boyle's law tells us is that there is an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. So what this tells us is that if the volume of a container decreases, then the pressure will increase. And the reason for this is due to molecular kinetic theory. So gas molecules are constantly moving and bouncing around randomly. When they are bouncing around, they're going to collide with the walls of this container. So looking at our example image down here, we can see that we have these sort of small balls bouncing around in this enclosed container. If we decrease that volume. What that tells us is that the those little balls are going to be bouncing around and hitting the container more frequently. And that in essence is pressure. The process in which we are changing or altering the volume of our lungs is reliant on many other muscles and processes. So in order for us to say, move our diaphragm and move our rib cage, we want the lungs to follow suit. So this is where we rely on something called an interpleural pressure. So we have this pleural cavity and it is a lower pressure when we compare it to the pressure inside of our lungs. How this works is essentially like a suction cup and it allows the lungs to sort of stick and hold onto the sides of your chest essentially. So that if you're ribs and chest move outwards, your lungs will move outwards as well. Now, this is very, very important when we look at the process that occurs when we try to breathe. The process of breathing in and breathing out, I'm going to break down into two categories each respectively. We either have quiet or passive breathing, or we have forced breathing. Now, quiet breathing is what you are all most likely doing right now. This is just your normal everyday breathing in which you are not overly straining for air. Now, the process of this is that your diaphragm will constrict. It's going to pull down. Now, the diaphragm is connected to your lungs. And what that is going to do is it's going to pull your lungs down. It's going to pull the lungs out and down, and it's going to cause them to expand with the goal being to increase that intrapulmonary volume. As the diaphragm constricts, it's going to cause the volume inside of my lungs to increase. Now, as we saw with Boyle's law, as volume goes up, pressure goes down. So what we notice there is the pressure inside of my lungs is going to decrease. Now, a common theme that we've been talking a lot throughout all of these series of videos is a gradient. A lot of things, concentration, pressure, they like to move down their concentration gradient. And as I said, pressure is no different. By increasing my the volume of my lungs, I am decreasing the pressure, which means that the air surrounding me right now, it's going to want to move from high pressure to low pressure. So it's going to want to move in through my mouth and nose, down through my pharynx, larynx, trachea, down to my alveoli, until that pressure between the air and my lungs is the same. Now, when we look at quiet expiration, it's essentially the opposite of what we saw with inspiration. But an important thing to keep note of, and this is something we're going to be discussing further in the next series of videos, is lung elasticity. So what's going to happen is when we want to quietly exhale, the diaphragm and our rib cage, those intercostal muscles there, they're all going to relax. And the lungs are very elastic. They're sort of like a balloon. If I blow up a balloon and then I let it go, the balloon itself, the elasticity there is going to help push that air out. And we see the same thing here with our lungs. So what's going to happen is due to the diaphragm not constricting anymore, it's now relaxing and our lung elasticity, it's wanting to sort of shrink in. The volume of our lungs is going to decrease. Now, again, Boyle's law tells us that as the volume decreases, the pressure is going to increase. 
which means that the air is going to be at a higher pressure inside of our lungs. So the intrapulmonary pressure is going to be higher than that of the surrounding air, which means that the air is then going to move out. And this is our Wyatt inhalation and exhalation. So the difference here between passive and forced inhalation and exhalation is a lot to do with sort of the volume of air that we're breathing in, but also we have the use of these secondary accessory muscles. So a forced inhalation, that's that real big, sharp increase. This is sort of when you're going for a run, you've got that increased demand of oxygen in your body and you need to really increase the amount of air moving into your lungs. Compared to a passive inhalation, you can see physically a lot of changes here when you're doing a forced inhalation. Just as an so passive inhalation, looking at me personally, there's not that much movement, especially in my upper body here, looking at my sternum and my, my rib cage. However, if I do a really big forced inhalation, what we see here is my rib cage being pulled superiorly and anteriorly. It's moving up and out and really expanding. We really want to stretch and increase that volume of those lungs as much as possible because the more volume we get in those lungs, the more pressure will decrease, which is going to inevitably allow more air to move into my lungs. Now, when we're looking at forced exhalation, what we are looking at here is essentially our abdominal muscles to push up against the diaphragm to help push and empty those lungs to try and reduce that volume to increase that intrapulmonary pressure resulting in exhalation. So we've got a few examples of some of our accessory muscles here. So for instance, we're looking at our sternocleomastoid that is connecting directly to the sternum, which means that if the sternocleomastoid is constricting, it's helping to pull my rib cage up. And what that is doing is it's helping to further expand my lungs, really open them up so I can get more air in. And again, this is a really big difference between our passive and forced modes of breathing.